What would you say is the best sci-fi movie ever made? The Empire Strikes Back, Blade Runner, 2001 A Space Odyssey, Alien, Star Trek Wrath of Khan, Matrix, Total Recall, or even The Adventures of Pluto Nash? Oh no, I don't like that. That makes me look like a big doofus, doesn't it, honey? Well, those are all well and good, and some of the best genre-defining films, obviously not Pluto Nash. But what if I told you there was a movie that defied the genre in every way? One that has stood the test of time and transcended the genre. The film I'm talking about is Luc Besson's 1997 classic, The Fifth Element. So let's hail a cab, win a contest to floss in paradise, and save the universe as we find out what the f happened to this movie. Luc Besson conceived the concept when he was just a teenager. He was inspired by French science fiction comics, particularly Valerian and Laureline, a project he would tackle later on. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. While writing, he envisioned that the story would be set in the year 2300 and would be about a nobody who wins a trip to the Club Med Resort on Floston Paradise in the Angel Constellation. This nobody then meets Lilu, who had the beauty of youth despite being over 2,000 years old. During the 1980s, he would develop the script even more, and in 1991, he had put together a 400-page script. He also was honing his craft, creating a documentary film entitled Atlantis, which is a film all about the nature and beauty of the ocean. Luc met with Patrice Ledoux and Nicolas Sidou from Gaumont, a French film company, to discuss production for The Fifth Element. He even sought after French comic creators Jean Giraud and Jean-Claude Mézier for the film's production design. Their comics were the inspiration that he would need for his overall design for the sci-fi opus. Meziel would design a Valerian comic entitled The Circles of Power, which had a character who drives a flying taxi cab around a congested metropolis on an alien planet. Luke was shown this and then fleshed out the concept for Corbin Dallas and his background. You have five points left on your license. Uh, thank you for reminding me. Besson would hire five other artists for the project, including Jean-Paul Gaultier for costume design. Luc Besson approached Bruce Willis and Mel Gibson for the role of Corbin Dallas. Willis expressed some interest but was reluctant to take on the part because of his two previous flops, Hudson Hawk and Billy Bathgate. Bunny! <laughs> Bubba! <laughs> Gibson would turn down the role. More heartache would come when film companies said no to taking on the film's $100 million budget. In December of 1992, production halted and the team disbanded. You are fired! Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. At least I want lunch. Good philosophy. In 1994, Besson moved on to his first commercially successful film, Leon the Professional. He comes to town every Tuesday. Are you free Tuesday? Yeah, I'm free Tuesday. The film takes place in New York City and is about a hitman who befriends a 13-year-old girl after her family is murdered by corrupt officers. The film stars Jean Reno, Natalie Portman, and Gary Oldman. Some even say, myself included, that it's Gary Oldman's best role and would cement him as one of the best actors of all time. Bring me everyone. What do you mean everyone? The film would gross over $45 million worldwide on a $16 million budget. During this successful time, Luke kept working on the script for The Fifth Element and not wanting to give up on his vision. He would reduce the film's budget to $90 million and went to Columbia Pictures, who had a hand in financing Leon. They would agree to finance the film. Luke Besson was going to go for a lesser-known actor to play the role of Corbin Dallas. One day, Besson was in Barry Josephson's office and was talking to Bruce Willis regarding another film that he was set to star in. Besson asked to speak to Willis to just say hello, and said that the fifth element was moving forward with a less expensive actor. Bruce said, quote, if I like the film, we can always come to an arrangement, end quote. Willis would then read the script and accept the role. I'll take the mission. Production for The Fifth Element would begin in August 1995. Besson and crew traveled to various places for casting, including Paris, London, and Rome. Gary Oldman would be hired as Jean-Baptiste Zorg, the head of a major corporation and supplier of various weapons and devices. You're a monster, Zorg. I know. 
Chris Tucker, Ian Holm, Luke Perry, Brian James, Tommy Tiny Lister Jr., and Tricky from Massive Attack were also cast in the film. I need to talk to someone. I don't believe this! This is not an exercise. This is a police control. Hey, I'm sorry. When it came time to hire Lilu, Besson would pick Mila Jovovich after seeing 200 to 300 applicants in person. Besson would go on to create a fake language entitled the Divine Language that Mila had to learn. The two would then have conversations and write letters to each other in this language to help her better understand the role that she was taking on. Chris Tucker's character, Ruby Rod, was originally given to Prince. Unfortunately, Prince couldn't take on the part because he couldn't schedule filming around his touring dates. Both Chris Tucker and Jamie Foxx were each considered for the role, but Besson felt that Tucker's smaller body suited the character much better. Even though I'm looking at this through biased eyes, I can't see anyone else as Ruby Rod, or would even give the same energetically manic performance the way Chris does. What was that? It was bad! It, it had nothing, no fire, no energy, no nothing! You know I have a shoulder on you, you know? Hmm? Hmm? And it must pop, pop, pop! As a lover of his homeland, Besson wanted to film the massive production in France. Unfortunately, he couldn't find any suitable facilities, so he would move the production to London. Filming would take place at Pinewood Studios on seven sound stages. Construction for these sets began in October 1995. The opening and closing scenes that were depicting Egypt were filmed in Mauritania, and Plava Laguna's opera scene was filmed at the Royal Opera House in London. Filming with actors began in January 1996 and was completed five months later. When Bruce Willis finished filming around May, Gary Oldman's scenes would begin. I am very disappointed! The designs of the New York City skyscrapers came from 1960s apartment designs, as well as futuristic designs from architect Antonio Santalia in the 1910s. Besson demanded that most action would take place in daylight and wanted a brighter, cheerfully crazy look, as opposed to a gloomy, realistic one. On to the costume design. Gaultier would design each of the 900 costumes that were worn by extras on the Floston Paradise ship. These designs were described as intellectually transgressive and were said to challenge challenge sexuality and gender norms. Mila's costume for Lilu, when she's first revived, was inspired by hospital dressing and bandages that provided minimal modesty, but today are considered to be some people's favorite costumes for conventions. I uh, I could take a few pictures. The archives. There were three different teams who would handle three different types of effects on the fifth element. Nick Adler would direct mechanical and pyrotechnical effects. Nick Dudman was placed in charge of creature effects, and Mark Stetson was in charge of the visual effects team. Digital Domain would be hired for the visual effects, and several different software was used to achieve the 90s visuals we've come to love today. Some shots in the film use a combination of live action, scale models, CGI, and particle systems. This is all present throughout the New York City scenes, and even though the movie came out in 1997, all of these visual effects still hold up incredibly well to this day. Fun fact, all of the stars in the background were created by poking holes in the sheet of black fabric. My favorite bit of history involving the production of this movie revolves around the New York City buildings. The production team would create scale models for the city. Apartment blocks and skyscrapers were constructed to be 20 feet high in a 1 24th scale. It took a team of 80 workers five months to build all the models. The windows of the buildings were cited by the team as one of the most time-consuming tasks, along with details behind the windows including furniture, blinds, and tiny pieces of flat artwork. Of course, virtual sets were built within digital environments to enhance the miniatures and make everything seem all that more real. Look out! Whoa. Because this film takes place in the 23rd century, there would need to be a different form of transportation. Flying cars, boats, and ships were constructed for the movie. Physical models were created, though, to serve as practical references. Majority of the scenes that these vehicles were in particularly the car chase, relied on visual effects. Mark Stetson utilized a combination of CGI and practical elements so the cars would look photorealistic in camera with the busy metropolis. Blue and green screen technology was used for this as well and allowed the actors to react and interact within the vehicles.
Now let's discuss the soundtrack and what a dose of nostalgia it is. The score was composed by Luc Besson's longtime collaborator, Eric Serra, and is considered intrinsically musical. Serra relied heavily on the use of orchestral texture and used many exotic influences. This can be seen in such scenes as the Stalinist fanfare heard before the spaceport, reggae music playing in preparation for the flight, and the hula music that is played when the passengers arrive on the Floston Paradise ship. He would even recruit Peter Gabriel to record the song's track, Little Light of Love. The most influential and memorable song from the film is the Diva Dance. It takes place on the Floston ship when a blue-skinned alien opera singer is performing. It combines operatic singing with electronic futuristic elements. Sarah showed soprano Inva Mula, who dubs the voice of the Diva. She would tell him that some notes were not humanly possible to achieve because the human voice can't change notes that fast. She would perform the notes in isolation, as opposed to singing all of the notes together. These notes were then digitized to fit the music. During this scene, we see Corbin Dallas gaze in awe at her performance. It's all real, because that was the first time Bruce had heard it and seen the actress in full makeup. The fifth element would make its first premiere on May 7, 1997 as the opening film for the Cannes Film Festival. Gaumont built an area for screening and included a fashion show designed by Gaultier himself, as well as fireworks and a futuristic ballet. The film would open domestically on May 9, 1997, coming in first place, earning $17 million on its opening weekend. It would go on to become a box office success grossing over $263 million worldwide. 75% of its receipts were from markets outside the US. It would become the most successful film of the French box office in 1997 and would hold the record of the highest grossing French film at the foreign box office for 16 years until Intouchables was released in 2011. It currently holds a 71% on Rotten Tomatoes, with critics at the time saying it's warm, fun, and boasts some of the most sophisticated production and costume design you've ever seen, while being a campy sci-fi extravaganza. My favorite. Alejandro Jodorowsky and Jean Girard sued Besson after the film was released, claiming that the fifth element had plagiarized their comic, The Incall. Girard sued for 13.1 million euros for unfair competition, 9 million euros in damages and interest, and 2 to 5 percent of the net operating revenues of the film. Jodorowsky sued for 700,000 euros. The case would be dismissed in 2004, on the grounds that only tiny fragments of the comic were used and that Jean had been hired by Besson to work on the film before the allegations were made. Yes! What's wrong with you? Just bring it up! Every time I'm leaving, just under the bottom or something! I'm leaving! <sighs> The fifth element originally released on home video in America on December 10th, 1997 to VHS, Laserdisc, and DVD. In 2001, Sony would release the film on its Superbit DVD with superior sound and picture quality compared to its less than stellar original DVD release. If you were to walk into any Bose store in the early 2000s, this movie would always be on display when purchasing a surround sound system for your home entertainment. For super fans like myself, we awaited the day that Sony would release a DVD with extras containing the making of the film. On January 11th, 2005, that wait would finally be over. The Fifth Element, the Ultimate Edition DVD. Get ready for Super Bit DTS High Voltage Fun. Bada boom. Big bada boom. Now with over two hours of new, never before seen extras, including six featurettes and more. The Fifth Element. Own the Ultimate Edition DVD. On June 20th, 2006, Sony would then release the first Blu-ray edition of the movie and would be criticized as having poor picture quality and lack of any features. Sony would actually respond to the complaints and in a rare move, remastered the Blu-ray release on July 17, 2007. They even offered a replacement exchange program for customers who were unhappy with the original Blu-ray. Since then, Sony has released a Digibook Blu-ray of the movie and a 20th anniversary 4K remaster, which has the best picture quality you could see for the film. Tell me, my man. You happy, uh, big world. Thrill, thrill, thrill. 
This film would be nominated for Best Sound Editing at the 70th Academy Awards, but would ultimately lose to Titanic. However, it would win the BAFTA Award for Best Special Visual Effects, and Luc Besson would take home the Lumiels Award for Best Director. Thierry Abogost, the cinematographer on the film, was awarded the Technical Grand Prize at the 1997 Cannes Film Festival for his work on this film and She's So Lovely. It would also receive four Saturn Award nominations for Best Science Fiction Film, Best Costume, Best Special Effects, and Best Supporting Actress. <laughs> There was even a movie tie-in game by Activision that was released in 1998 for the PlayStation 1 console and PC. The PS1 game is considered to be one of the worst movie tie-in games of all time, whereas the PC version was better received. I have played the PlayStation 1 version and can say that it's incredibly frustrating and some of the worst controls I've ever played on a console. In 2001, New York Race was released on the PlayStation 2, Game Boy Color, and PC. It was a racing game based on the film and was least exclusively in Europe. However, if you look around eBay or Mercari, you're bound to find a decent copy if you're into nostalgia video games. Since its initial release, the film has been considered a sci-fi cult classic. Bruce Willis would even go on to say, quote, it was a real fun movie to make, end quote. And Mila Jovovich described working with Basson as, quote, the first really amazing director I had worked with, end quote. While many people will compare it to Star Wars, which is incredible, and I have loved those movies for as long as I can remember, they aren't as special to me as The Fifth Element. I'm sure people watching this are thinking, you're crazy, and that's totally fine. As a 90s kid, my idol was Bruce Willis. From Die Hard 3, 12 Monkeys, Hudson Hawk, and The Last Boy Scout, he was a staple of my childhood. His performance, as well as the eye-opening scenes, have stayed lodged in the front of my brain forever. We're sending somebody into the dossier! <laughs> Anybody else want to negotiate? In conclusion, The Fifth Element is a visually inventive and entertaining film that has become a cult classic. It boasts a distinctive style, eclectic characters, an imaginative world, which all add up to what some would say, including myself, is the staple of sci-fi action films. Whether you like it or not, it's a film that offers both a fun and memorable cinematic experience. Lilu Dallas Multipass. Yeah. Lena at Multipass, you know it's Multipass. Lena Dallas, my wife, we're newlyweds, just met. You know how it is, bump into each other, sparks happen. Yeah, she knows it's a Multipass. <laughs>